Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Friday, February 19th installment of the Silicon Insider, the only uncentered look at life and business in Silicon Valley. My name is Mike Malone. I've been covering this town longer than anybody. I'm here with our special contributor, Scott Budman, business and tech reporter for NBC Bay Area. Our producer is Jordan Henderson. Our East Coast correspondent is Bob Grove. And our host for this podcast, as always, is the Silicon Valley Business Journal. I kept that opening short because we got so much to talk about, Scott. Okay, yes, ready? Do. Yes, hello. We landed on Mars. That's kind of the, the one fun thing I, I could find in the news <laughs> in the last few days. That's pretty cool. And there's, yeah, a, lot and of Silicon Valley, there's a lot of Silicon Valley on, on that device, too. Right. And I think that's going to keep this area hopping when it comes to the space program. This was a real win, not just for NASA and America, but for Silicon Valley as well. NASA Ames had a lot to do with the heat shield, which kept the landing safe. Uh, but also, I think in the next couple of days, we're going to see this cool little helicopter that they have uh, made out of NASA Ames. It's going to go around taking a lot of images in addition to the images that the rover can send back. And the fact that the landing stuck and then we were getting images within a few minutes is amazing. I mean, this is from Mars and uh, there's a lot of uh, updated technology from past rover projects. And I think that will get more people involved, which means more young people are gonna say, hey, I wanna do this as a career in the future. Sounds like my childhood, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, know, I, I remember the sheer excitement. We were all gonna grow up and be astronauts because it was so exciting. Now, I was still intrigued about that drone helicopter. That atmosphere is so thin that I don't know how the rotors actually get any lift. I mean, there's less gravity, of course, but still, that's gonna, that's almost like pretty close to being on top of Mount Everest. You can't fly a helicopter to the top of Mount Everest because the air is so thin. So how are they doing it out there? I mean, this thing have gigantic rotors and a little one pound camera? No, I mean, remember it all fit into the Packet yeah. was sent, uh, so it, it's not that big, and I, I don't know. Um, it's a good question. Uh, one of the things they want to do is take the carbon dioxide on the Mars, on the Martian atmosphere, and somehow transfer it to oxygen. If they can do enough of that, then they say, "Ah, this is good." If we ever want to actually travel to Mars as humans, so right. taking steps towards that um, future. Yeah, you need you need oxygen to to get back. You need the fuel. Yes, that too. <laughs> Uh, if there's enough carbon dioxide, you can start terraforming if you want to, too. Which, you know, that's always sitting out there in the back of everybody's mind. Apparently, it would take several hundred years. So, you know, it isn't going to happen. It isn't, it isn't going to be, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger movie where it's just suddenly the whole planet's covered green. But, you know, if we're going to start, let's start. It's a big win for NASA. You know, I grew up in that NASA world. I, you know, my dad was out there at Ames. I was at, I would, as a kid, go out there and play. That's really where the computer revolution, the personal computer revolution began because they had a computer sitting there with terminals in the lobby of Ames. And I remember Steve, Steve Wozniak using that computer. I use that computer and we all got into computers playing on the NASA Ames and that's where homebrew began was out there at Moffett Field. People don't realize that, but there was a, a Boy Scout Explorer post there dedicated to computers and a lot of those, those kids went into homebrew. So that's really important. And, and, and we forget that in the great story of the Valley. And I think NASA needs some wins. I mean, NASA right now, it's sort of, it looks like they're, they're focusing on social engineering and you know all of that while the commercial side has been doing great it's been taking off and there's been some real questions is nasa still important they can't seem to get that mega rocket they're building that super rocket they're building to work and it's way out there in cost overruns meanwhile elon and you know bezos and all that they're racing along and the other countries are moving forward too it sort of says, okay, maybe we know what NASA's, where their wheelhouse is now, you know, really brilliantly engineered probes. And let's leave the, the bus driving, the station, space shuttle and all that to the commercial world. You buy that? I do. And I think that that's where that uh, sweet spot of the relationship may be, because we're starting to see NASA's success when it comes to these Mars rovers and the exploration, just as we're seeing the success of the private companies like Blue Origin and SpaceX, 
which is a little bit different. And yet they all seem to want to work together, at least publicly, and that's a good sign. So I think this is a, a good spot where we're starting to see both sides, the government side and the private side, start to have successes simultaneously and even working together. And it's thrilling. I mean, this is the fulfillment all through the 60s, right up to the last Apollo mission and a little bit beyond, there was this feeling we had momentum. This was our destiny. We were heading for the stars and then we just shut it all down. And we haven't been there in a long time. And the idea of eventually, you know, hopefully in my life this time to see another person step on a, another moon or a planet or something and begin that movement of mankind out there is really exciting. I mean, Neil, I was actually the last guy to talk civilian, non-family guy, to actually communicate with Neil Armstrong. He, I was working on a book and I interviewed him and all that. The weekend before he died, we, we were, he did the final corrections on, my, on this Eagle Scout book I wrote. And um, I, you know, I sensed that he was, he was remembering and the importance of it all. And it had to have been frustrating to him that, that man wasn't back on the moon. We weren't living there. I mean, we were supposed to be inhabiting the moon by now and moving on to Mars. So, okay, we'll take, we'll call it a 25, 30 year hiatus, but here we go, hopefully. Okay, Facebook. What is Facebook doing? I mean, you know, it, it, did, did nobody sit down with Zuckerberg or better yet with Sheryl Sandberg? I mean, she's supposed to be the adult in the room and say, you can't punish a country by turning off your service. I mean, that's just so heavy handed. It's kind of breathtaking. I'm surprised there's not more coverage on the news. I know they're going crazy in Australia, but it's like, oh, you didn't, you didn't, uh, you changed the rules on us a little bit. We have to pay for news. Fine. Facebook blackout for an entire subcontinent. Wow. That's and that's a, lot of, that's a lot of people. And because the world is so flat, it's even people trying to get you know, their Australian news from elsewhere. So it's not just Australia, if you think about it, largely because sure. companies like Facebook, we're all in this together. And so the idea, and it, it, remember, this is an idea that's not brand new. Uh, Europe has much tougher restrictions when it comes to social media companies like Facebook right. uh, than we do. Australia steps up and says, hey, we want our journalists to be paid when their stuff gets uh, passed around on Facebook. And as someone who works in a newsroom, that's not a new idea. <laughs> the idea yeah. that hey, we should get paid for our content if it gets circulated around on Facebook. Enterprises should have control of their product. Frankly, all of us individuals should have control of our data. And Facebook is trying to, you know, Canute trying to hold back the wave saying, oh, no, 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 no. We keep getting all this stuff for free and then we get to monetize it. And that's like, wow. You can't do that. It's fairly significant, I think, that Google is talking to Australia about a potential deal. And Facebook, for some reason, I'm sure there are people talking about this. And hopefully the Australian ban will go away. But uh, it's not a new idea. The idea that, hey, if you're making ad revenue on our content, we should be able to share that. You know, Google ads, the thing that you saw on the sides of your uh, of your Google searches and Gmail, that was how that sort of worked. And it seemed to work very well for a lot of companies who put their stuff up on Google and who advertised on Google. It was shared, uh, much like Apple shares the revenue with its app developers. And I think Facebook is gonna have to come up with something like this because it's a bad look, as you say, to, to shut down and go dark. Oh, all the time. One of the newspapers down there declared it an act of war by Facebook. I mean, and I, I was a, kind of appalled that Tim Berners-Lee, of all people, the guy who created the web, says came out on the side of Facebook saying, well, net neutrality demands that, you know, the Internet should be free and available. And I thought, well, you're kind of getting behind the times, Tim, because free and available means that there's some enterprise out there that's making money off your work, you know. And well, it's, it's free to the user, but... Um... It's not free or to not the creator. To the yeah, to the creator. Right. yeah, exactly. Okay, well, as long as we're having uh, <clears throat> talking about Facebook, um, did you see that the, uh, apparently some legal papers got uh, made public 
that in 2017, Sheryl Sandberg had known for years that Facebook was making, was counting users and counting revenues that it shouldn't have. And people there knew it and it's just coming out now. Yeah, you know, everything about Facebook is, is coming out because there are so many former Facebook people who perhaps emboldened by the fact that they've already made enough money are saying, hey, I was in at those meetings and I said, we, you know, someone said, hey, we need to be doing this on a more honest metric, a more honest basis. Um, and uh, I, I don't know that this will be a major thing, but it, it does look bad for the company. Again, uh, they can't seem to get out of their own way. Yeah. And, you know, I'm kind of surprised about Sheryl Sandberg. I mean, the transformation of her image. She went from being right and she's going to handle Zuckerberg and all that about the time that she was writing lean forward you know a hero to all the girls in America and then boom she starts becoming Zuckerberg's apologist she starts looking like a mob lawyer like well she's she's honest but she's representing a dishonest company and now it seems like oh no 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 she's actually actually consigliere in all of this I mean her reputation is plummeting right now it seems to me that, you know, she used to be the, the gold standard we all went to for what what's proper business behavior. Now she's pretty solid by all this. Well, and I think that's because, I mean, for a lack of a better way to put this, she's at Facebook. I mean, you look at uh, Mark Zuckerberg, Andrew Bosworth, Sheryl Sandberg, all of them are seen as, well, brilliant people who have done amazing things, but they're at Facebook and therefore they haven't been honest. They haven't paid the people they should pay. Uh, you know, there are all these things that are, you know, the whole Cambridge Analytica thing. I mean, this is enough to stain your reputation because you're at a place that really, again, can't get out of its way when it comes to trying to decide how do we weigh free speech versus content? Do we pay for content? There's so many things that Facebook is dealing with awkwardly, if not just flat out badly. And when you're an executive, there's no way that that's not going to stain your reputation. Now, does this constitute criminal behavior? Use it, basically covering up inaccurate metrics in order to make money off of customers. Is that misrepresentation? I mean, I don't know. I can see a civil suit arising from it, but does a criminal suit, does the Justice Department get involved with this right now? Well, I mean, geez, you know, the Justice Department seems to love getting involved with Facebook and social media yeah. in general. And, uh, you know, it, it seems that we were wondering earlier, hey, in the Biden administration, will there still be hearings? Apparently, the answer is yes, <laughs> pretty quickly. We had hearings for Robin Hood that, you know, just kicked yeah. off uh, a day ago. And, and Facebook and Google are already being brought up again as, hey, we need to talk about antitrust. So uh, I don't think anything's off the table when it comes to government uh, you know, what the government is going to want to do and, and perhaps regulate at Facebook. And even Mark Zuckerberg himself has said, hey, we welcome some regulation, but that hasn't happened smoothly yet either. Yeah, no, it's interesting. They're not backing off either. Facebook has not changed their behavior in any obvious way to me. I mean, usually when the feds come in and there's this much bad publicity, like with this heavy handedness with Australia, the company goes, well, we better clean up our act a little bit. We got to back off for a few years. I mean, even IBM backed off after the antitrust thing in the, at the end of the 50s, early 60s. Not Facebook, man, it is. Damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. Interesting. You see it. They're either going to win or there's going to be a huge, you know, they're going to hit an iceberg out there pretty soon. You just sense yeah. it. I mean. Right. And this is, uh, you know, part and parcel of, of what a lot of people have talked about in the Silicon Valley culture where, you know, the, the bottom line, whether it's your revenue or your stock price or the fact that you're still hiring people uh, is still strong. And so you feel emboldened to keep going. We saw that at Uber. We've seen that uh, at a lot of the food delivery services that are not treating their customers well. We saw it at Amazon. We're seeing it at Facebook. Uh, and and I, I don't know where the cutoff, where the, the price to be paid is, because we really haven't yeah. seen it all that much yet. Yeah, exactly. Uh, real quick, because I want I want to get into Robinhood in a second here. Uh, just quick news: or, uh, quarterly earnings are up at Applied again. Applied Materials, it's still going. Uh, Roku. You know, good for them. I mean, they've been around for a long time. I, I literally had a Roku box in my house sitting for two years. I never even plugged it in. It was a gift from somebody. And I plugged it in. It was like, oh, good Lord, it's changed my life completely. 
They really made a pivot that was, I mean, a trillion dollar pivot, if you think about it. It was Roku and TiVo. And back when, you know, TiVoing something was kind of new and cool, yeah. TiVo insisted it was going to stick with the box, which I think was a fatal mistake because everyone could copy the software. And therefore, yeah. if they stuck with software instead of the actual physical box, they would have been the Microsoft of media and forget about it. Every cable company would have had to license their software and it would have been a much different world. Uh, Roku pivoted and said, we want to be the delivery system for all the streaming content. And they've been boom, right in the middle of it all, as Netflix and Disney Plus, et cetera, et cetera, Hulu um, has all come into your living room. And you're right, they were very patient. They were quiet for a lot of years sitting down there in Los Gatos. And uh, boy, have they just killed it since going public. And they're just in such a sweet spot that uh, everybody wants to be on one side or the other of Roku. Well, I mean, isn't the lesson of the digital revolution that the more, the quicker you can get away from the physical world into the digital world, from hardware to software to app, the better off you're going to be. I mean, that's 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 how you win in this town. You don't stick you don't stick in the box very long. You've got to keep moving on. That's been true for everything. Um, okay, Robin Hood on the hill. Okay, that was a weird experience watching that on TV. You know, I mean, it's it's like. Okay, we had Dorsey and we had Zuckerberg, and that was weird enough for the average American to look at. <laughs> but now we've got now we've got the Robin Hood guys, <laughs> and oh my goodness, uh, what's this guy's name? Tenev. Vlad, yeah. Yes, Vladimir. Yeah, you know it's interesting with with Dorsey and Zuckerberg, and to an extent, Sundar Pichai. People thought, ah, so this is the image of the young tech executive. Um, you know chop that age in half and you have the Robin Hood guys and now it's a new like, whoa, they're getting younger. Yeah, I was going to say, those are old guys now. Right, <laughs> right. And yeah, I love the haircut. I love the haircut. I love the attitude. And that, that little exchange with Maxine Waters where he's just going to say what he's going to say and she keeps saying no, yes or no. And he just walks right over the top of it and She's getting angrier and angrier, and he looks oblivious to all of that. It was a very strange political theater, I have to say. Yeah, oblivious is a good word, and yet it's not the word you want to use when you're describing someone running a financial empire. Uh, I wonder what this is doing. We know that the whole GameStop saga and the fact that Robin Hood couldn't handle the trades and the fact that it turns out now we know why they were able to do uh, commission free trades because they're, you know, getting money from the citadels of the world. I mean, it's all, uh, you know, it's all messy. And yet the funding keeps coming in for Robin Hood. So clearly they're on a path to go public. Uh, but you just wonder, is this a company we can trust? Maybe it's the new model, but is this the company we can trust going forward to handle large numbers of investments and billions and billions of dollars? It just didn't look that good on, on TV. Well, it certainly looked dangerously clever that the hedge collateral situation. He didn't have enough reserves to cover all the trades that were exploding, right? And right. so he went out to get more money, $3 billion in collateral to cover it. He was waiting there to help him out with the hedge fund guys. You know, these guys are clever. They're very, very good. And they, you know, even when they get hurt on one end, they've got it covered on the other. I mean, it's, it, the whole thing is so weird and sketchy. And you get the feeling, oh my God, this is what the future looks like. We have, you know, these brilliant 23 year olds setting up these strange companies offering basically crowdsourcing for different parts of American life. Everybody gets to play. And then the whole thing blows up. And then the bad guys sneak in the back door and you can't tell who the good and, and all these kids in their, in their kids in their ba parents' basement make a million dollars and then lose it in 48 hours. I mean, the sheer craziness and volatility and chaos of all this does not augur well for our future. <laughs> well, right. I mean, remember when E-Trade was new and, you know, the, the idea of, of sort of democratizing the investments and it was messy for a little bit and people didn't trust it. Now that's sort of old technology. Sure. Is this going to come in with the, the free trades and the easy trades and the, uh, you know, doing it on your phone with an app? 
um, yeah, I think we're going to get there. Uh, I just don't know that this is the, the vehicle. I think someone, some entrepreneur is waiting in the wings saying, I can do this without all the mess. And I can do this knowing I'm going to be up 24 seven and not have these down times when people are going to be super nervous. And, and in, in Robin Hood, you know, one of the reasons they're on Capitol Hill, they've had disasters, not just financially, but someone who, you know, one of the users committing suicide because he thought he owed all this money and yeah. not being able to get in touch with the company. These are very important things that are still lacking. And, uh, and therefore, I, I, don't, I don't know that this is completely ready for prime time yet. Yeah, but, you know, it's interesting to speculate what would have happened to Robin Hood if they had had the cash reserves to cover all the trades? Would they have kept this going? Or would they have would they have asserted some sort of controls over the process? I mean, it got it got externally forced upon them to shut this thing down, and they did it badly. And you know, people killing themselves because they because nobody answered the phone call or the emails to Rob. Well, what if they'd had the dough? What would how would this scenario have played out over several weeks? I mean, would it just gotten bigger and bigger and exploded? It would have just would have grown and deflated as these kids got out of their trades. You know, it's we we got to know, we got to speculate on what would happen because it's going to happen next time because the next one that comes in is going to have enough money to back ten million trades. Right, but remember, it wasn't just the Army of David's. It wasn't just the kids trading. Hedge funds are in in on this, and sure enough. Uh, some selling started to take place that got very rapid. And so yeah. a lot of the kids and everyone just, whoa, I guess we have to get out of this. We're not going to keep on hold, you know. Um, on the other hand, uh, Wall Street did put in many stops as this thing went up and then down so fast. And so I think Robinhood as a vehicle, if it was more efficient, could be the next vehicle for how people trade. But it's got to be more efficient. It can't run out of money. Yeah. All of a sudden shut down. Um, I mean, you know, 9-11 stopped Wall Street, but everybody was like, I get it. We're going to pause. We're going right. to get out. Uh, Robin Hood was stopped just because flat out ran out of cash. That can't happen. Right, exactly. Okay, we have another new phenomenon, which is Clubhouse. Have you been invited on Clubhouse yet? Yes. yes. You have? Oh, good I for have. you. Been in, been in some rooms and, uh, you know, it's... it's uh, a lot of these things. I, well, you're I, part of the Illuminati now. I had no exactly. idea. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, it's um, it's interesting that the people I'm hearing from are largely the venture capitalists. I deal with them a lot for stories. They're getting in there to say, hey, here's the next big thing. Let's talk about it as opposed to just tweet it or put it on, you know, Medium or something. And, and that's interesting. I, I don't know how far this goes, but it, if, if people are, you know, respectful and, you know, the, the way you raise a hand similar to what you do on Zoom, uh, you know, it, it's an interesting uh, way to, to get some, some information and to hear from people. Um, you know, we've already had Elon Musk in one of these, Jack Dorsey in one of these, you know, we're, we're hearing from people. Um, I, I just don't know exactly how, how big it gets or where it goes, but it, it seems to be growing somewhat organically because people on Twitter are saying, hey, let's take this you know, write written thing and let's take it over to Clubhouse for a discussion. Yeah. Sure, Twitter is coming up with its own thing and Facebook is coming up with its own. They have thing. to, that's a good sign. Exactly, so there is something to this, yeah. I think they've what, just 8.1 million global downloads of the app between, well, they had 3.5 million February 1st and 8.1 million February 16th. You know, the, that kind of, 10x growth literally in days is is an indicator that's whenever you see 10x on you know you know this in this valley when you see 10x that means something important has happened and it sounds like i think the in the appeal of this the fact that it's not really censored it's keeps away from the cancel culture because everything is essentially the equivalent of off the record it's not recorded I mean, is that the real appeal of it? I mean, by these really important, powerful people, you know, they make a public statement that, you know, the, the stock, their stock can be frozen on the exchanges and all hell breaks loose on CNBC and all that. They can talk like normal people without fear of being, of being exposed or being misunderstood or affecting the stock value or any of that. Um, I mean, I, I, would, I would disagree only because anything you say is, is, out there, you know, it may not be recorded, but uh, 
there are journalists in the rooms that that might you know then put yeah. what you said on Twitter or something like that. Um, but there is what I've experienced is is a little more free to talk because you're talking to people who uh, you're either preaching to a choir, which can get a little annoying, and and you know people like to hear themselves talk, but also you might have a crowd of people who are really interested in what this VC or that CEO or that PR executive has to say. Um, and that's interesting. And, and so I think that's why this particular medium is, is starting to take off. And as we said, starting to be copied, uh, you know, with versions coming on other uh, companies' platforms as well. So what happens when the journalists, you know, start swarming over it and start taking notes and publishing it and that sort of thing? Does that destroy Clubhouse? I mean, I don't think so. I, I think people know that that's going to happen. I, I think it's, um, I mean, you know, that's going to happen. And, you know, the PR yeah. people are, are going to start pitching stories that way because that's what they do. I mean, it seems to me it's this is a very evanescent little experience that's going to be fun to remember before the, you know, all the various creatures, you know, appear and destroy it. And well, it was, look at the it'll, same it'll things. Fun thing. Yeah, same things were said about, uh, you know, the live streaming media, whether it was, you know, Periscope or Facebook Live, and that started to take off and people started to rush in and the skeptics were saying, oh, this is going to be a disaster. People are going to, and it really wasn't. It brought a lot of people into live events. NASA used it for launches. SpaceX used it. You still uses it for launches. Um, you know, and, and those of us reporters were able to say, hey, here's something happening live. It was actually a really, really good way to get information out. Uh, Clubhouse may be the same way, but in a little more of a, um, I mean, it's called Clubhouse. I, I think one of them is going to be called Fireside, you know, just to try to, hey, a little comfortable, let's hang out together, let's talk. Um, and hopefully it'll go smoothly. But yeah, of course, someone's going to say something controversial. And there you go. It'll be off to the race. You know how these things go. We know. We, de we definitely know how these things go. Uh, note from Bob Grove. He's noting that... Um, uh, there's a lot of companies now starting to complain about this uh, NVIDIA acquisition of ARM. You know, we got uh, Google, Microsoft, Qualcomm worried about this $40, mil $40 billion deal because it, you know, NVIDIA now basically controls the semiconductor industry if it gets ARM. And I think a lot of these downstream big companies are waking up going, oh, wait a minute. You know, where do we get our chips now? Uh, Apple's, oh, Apple, yeah, Apple's not happy either because, you know, what did they do? They moved over to, you know, using these these specialized chips. And, uh, you know, this this puts NVIDIA invidiously right at the center of controlling everything in tech, everything digital. Now is kind of starting to migrate through NVIDIA. Yeah, it's been a long time since NVIDIA was able to do anything quietly in Silicon Valley, and they never will be again. They're just too big and too successful. Um, and so now, I mean, yeah. they A, are able to make a $40 billion purchase. That's something pretty new for them. And B, of course, they're now in this discussion of are they getting too big and too powerful, uh, which they complained about along with lots of companies that used to be, or you know, that were that size back when they were smaller would complain about Intel and even AMD. And now NVIDIA is the uh, the monolith, still moving quickly and growing quickly. And is it growing too quickly? We'll see. Well, we're heading toward an interesting battle. You know, Intel's revitalized, AMD's doing great, and NVIDIA. Like uh, you know, Intel versus AMD versus Zilog 40 years ago. That, that, gave, that benefited all of us in very big ways. Um, 25 by 25, what do you think? That's you the, know, uh, it's, it's a good idea. Green will make 25% of their staff underrepresented minorities. Right. Uh, that's what do you think? Launched today. Um, you know, it's, it's a good idea. It's, uh, I, you know, we constantly hear from companies, oh, where are the candidates? They're there. They'll find them. Um, something like this, I think it's Joint Venture Silicon Valley that launched this already. Twitter's on board. Um, and it's, it's a good idea. It's, uh, it should, it shouldn't take a big, you know, event. It shouldn't take a slogan to get to this point, but, uh, if it does, and it's how we get there, then, then good, let's get there. Uh, you know, we've got to get to the point where, uh, companies don't just talk about diversity, but do it because it's always been good for business. Yeah. It's been good for business, but interestingly, the Valley has always been 
oh, we're a meritocracy. We don't, we're completely colorblind. We don't care where somebody comes from. All we want is the best and the brightest and, you know, the best and the brightest. I mean, that's what Google's claim always was. And then now it's, we're basically saying, I mean, there's always this fear that if you're, if your criteria is different from the best and the brightest, you know, with, you know, looking at a resume, not knowing the person's background, color or anything else, and you picking the best versus we, we're going to go through this filter first before we make our pool of choices. Does that compromise the Valley anyway? I'd say no, because I, I, I don't think, honestly, the Valley looked for the best and the brightest. I think they looked through a filter since the very beginning, and yeah. you know what that filter looked like. And that's why companies look like what they look like, because they were. Especially, yeah, especially that when they finally have to show up for the job interview. Right. I mean, you know, it's, it's not that, you know, well, we tried. They haven't tried. Yeah. They'll try, and I think they'll succeed at getting a more diverse workforce because they're finally going to try. Um, and, uh, you know, Steve Jobs admitted this long ago, uh, look, we need to find engineers of color. I know they're out there. We haven't been looking and, you know, again, yeah, well, you know, I don't want, I, Steve Jobs' opinion, when he died, Rich Carlgaard, the publisher of Forbes called me and said, look at their last annual report, the executive row of Apple computer. You've never seen so many older white guys in your life. I don't think there was even a woman on executive row at Apple because uh, Steve drove off on Hancock and all that. Apple was the whitest management team I've ever seen them in, in, this, in the beginning of the 21st century. So Steve could do lip service to all of that, but he didn't behave like that. Right, and, and that, was, that was endemic for a lot of companies. They talked a good game, but they didn't. And so again, it's too bad we need this sort of initiative, but if this is what it takes, it's on, let's do it. Okay, well, we're out of time. That's it for now, folks. Uh, you can find us on the Silicon Valley Business Journal homepage, as well as on Spotify, Anchor, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. We'll see you all next week. Take care, Scott. Bye-bye.